Welcome to Random Book Talk. Caroline Overington is a successful journalist, novelist, speaker and newly appointed associate editor at the Australian Women's Weekly. Welcome Caroline. It's nice to be talking about your new book, Sisters of Mercy. What's your secret to this incredible hectic working life? To be honest with you, Brett, I thrive on being busy and I think that the best example of that is not so much my working life, but when I was told that I was going to be having the twins. Because I remember thinking to myself, I have never even had one baby, so how am I going to cope suddenly with having two? And I remember my mother saying to me that when you're really busy like that, all people really expect is for you to be able to cope. And as long as you can just cope, then you'll be doing fine. And I found that that has been true with the juggle between having the children, having the job and writing the books. As long as I'm busy, I feel like I'm coping, everything's okay. If I wasn't that busy, I'm not sure that I would have that feeling that I was coping, if that makes sense. Yes, that makes sense. You're on a bit of a roll with the books. This is your fourth with Random House and follows the bestsellers Ghost Child, I Came to Say Goodbye and Matilda is Missing, which uh, was published last year. How, how would you describe Sisters of Mercy and, and how does it differ from your previous books? Well, the main thing is I have never written about sisters in this way before. And from my point of view, the relationship between sisters is such an important one. Now, in this book, it's a little unusual because you've got sisters who were born a generation apart and also worlds apart. So one of them was born um, at a time of war and placed in an orphanage um, and raised there. And the other was born here in Australia to the same set of parents, mm. but after they've migrated. They only come together when the father dies and there's the issue of the will. And then of course what happens is one of them goes missing and the other one is accused somehow of being involved. And the question for the reader is, what has happened? Has a crime been committed and what kind of crime is it? Um, and to me that was a kind of fascinating idea because of course we always assume that sisters will be close but that's not necessarily the case, as we know. And mm. we also think that sisters kind of know each other really mm. well, mm. and that's not the case in this book either. Mm. So I was kind of interested in exploring all those questions. It makes it quite different from the other books. For example, um, Matilda is Missing about a custody case, mm. and I Came to Say Goodbye, which is a, it's about mental illness in a family and how that affects a family. This is um, a dysfunctional family, but dysfunctional for very different reasons. Yeah, there's an urgency. Uh, to this book uh, and I'd probably say to all of your books and as a reader and that keeps me turning the pages um, there's an immediacy and there's almost a hyper real state I mean the beginning of this book opens with that amazing day a few years ago in Sydney with the dust storm and where, where Agnes walks out into the dust and um, I won't give the story away but it's peppered with those facts and uh, which I really enjoyed as a reader and I know others do as well. How would you describe your writing style? Well I think that that's one of the things that I'm really grateful for actually is that I've had this really long background in journalism and so a lot of the things that happen in the books that I write are it, it's of course they're real mm. so there really was a dust storm in Sydney and I remember waking up on that day in 2009 and looking outside the window and there was that glorious pink light and I remember thinking you know the world has come to an end what what is this this is an, an atomic bomb has exploded or a meteorite has hit and then I remember sort of putting on the TV and, and, and the hosts of the Today Show were saying, well, no, it's okay, it's not the end of the world, just a dust storm. And then it was so beautiful and so surreal, but you couldn't really see a metre in front of you. And I remember thinking on that day, you know, somebody could disappear in this. If you were going to disappear, this would be the day to do it, to just walk out and never be seen again, because you really couldn't. I remember being down on Bondi Beach, the famous iconic Bondi Beach. Of course, a lot of the images people have is of the top of the Harbour Bridge sure. just being missing in the yes. storm. But for me, it was of surfers walking down the sand and then just disappearing into the sea because you couldn't see anything. Yeah. And that, I suppose, I have those, because I covered that event as a reporter and I've covered other events as a reporter, the disappearance of children, people, walking out of their homes and never being seen again. Mm. And I've often wondered to myself, how does it happen? And my idea in the novels is to try to figure it out when there's been a mystery, to try and solve it if I can. Mm, I thought it was a wonderful way to start a book. In fact, in your books, you, you pepper uh, the stories with 
bits of current affairs and uh, popular culture that kind of speak to the attitudes of Australia. Particularly in this new book in the 1970s, I sort of had flashbacks of my own childhood. Um, how does the past for you sort of inform your characters? Well, it, it is interesting because obviously I grew up in the 1970s as well. Um, but for me, the historical part of this book that is most interesting is the way we used to treat people who were in institutions. You know, it used to be that everybody who had any kind of mental illness or any kind of disability was just stuck in an institution and left there. Mm. And as we all know, that's now changed mm. and they've, all the institutions have closed. But when I was doing my research, I found that some things that we would today find shocking were in those days very real. So for example, if you were in a mental institute, the chances are that all of the nurses would be men, which is very rare today. Yeah. Um, and the reason they were men was because they needed to be really big guys to handle these quite mad patients, to sort of lock them into their straight jackets and push them into their padded cells. Um, and they had this thing that they called thump therapy, which was very real. Mm. The men, the male nurses would go around the institutes at night and hit the patients to get mm. them to be quiet. Mm. And then of course, there was this societal change, society changes and we think to mm. ourselves, oh, it's much better if we, we close the institutions and we bring all these people out into the community. Um, if you talk to a person, as I've done as a journalist, a, a parent who's maybe, maybe in their 70s or 80s, who has a profoundly disabled child hmm. who is 50 or 60 and sometimes often very overweight because they haven't been able to do much exercise in their life, who might be incontinent, who can't get out of bed, who can't feed themselves, who has to wear a sort of giant nappy, and, and you say to them, this 80 year old couple, you have to take this child in now and you have mm. to look after them for the rest of their life. Mm. That couple loves their child, but they can't do it. Mm. They just can't physically do it. They can't lift the person in and out of bed. They can't, mm. and they worry, what will happen when I die? Mm. When, when we naturally die, what will happen to our child that used to live mm. safely in a place where we knew they were safe? And mm. so when I'm thinking about the past, I'm always thinking, the decisions we made then weren't perfect, mm. but the decisions we're making now aren't perfect either. Mm. So we need to find a middle ground. And sometimes when you compare the two, that's how you find the middle ground. Mm. Children, I guess, often are the victims in mm. a number of your stories. And to sort of, I suppose, to speak to what you were just talking about then, they're, they're often in vulnerable situations. Um, either domestically or, or in institutions. Um, I've read all your books, you know, from, so in Ghost Child. We Me all, too. Yeah, <laughs> and enjoyed them all. And, Thank you. And, you know, it is, whilst confronting, uh, I found it very interesting to read these stories and, and they do ring true, uh, you know, because you do read about stories like this happening um, in the paper and you see news broadcasts on TV. What's your response to how we, we treat or, and or protect children who are in vulnerable situations? To be honest with you, Brett, to me, the children in the stories um, are symbols of the vulnerable amongst us. Mm -hmm. and, it, and it need not be children. Of course, children are very vulnerable, but so are the elderly and so are the ill and so are the disabled, um, and so are people who have had a traumatic event in their lives, and so are people who are going through a divorce mm. um, or are going through a, a major change in their life, the death of a parent or the death of a child. There are always people amongst us who are suffering. And to me, the feeling about them is, do we do enough? Because mm. we are a very rich community, a very rich society. I mean, anyone who has traveled to many countries around the world will know mm. how lucky we are. Mm. We're in the middle of uh, a boom mm. unlike any we've ever seen before. Mm. Um, do we do enough to take care of those of us who need a hand? And I'm not convinced that we do. Mm. And I think the reason that I'm not convinced is because as a working journalist, I've seen it too often. People who have fallen through cracks and that has become a cliche because it's true. Mm. There are so many cracks that you can fall through. Mm. And the number of times a family has come to me, having suffered the most terrible loss, mm. let's say for example, a child who um, suffered a mental illness, has fallen into drug abuse, um, his family has broken up, uh, grandchildren now in peril, who just needed a bit of assistance. And earlier on, on not when it's too late, it's too mm. late when you start talking about putting people in prison. Mm. There's things that we can do early on. So when I'm writing the books, I'm often thinking to myself, 
I believe there is an enormous well of goodwill in our community. I mm. think Australians are incredibly generous people and I think that when we pay our taxes and we contribute to various charities, we do so because we care. Mm. As a result, we should be doing better than yeah. we are doing. And so that's the message that I'm trying to get across. Mm. And in, in Sisters of Mercy, I mean, just specifically talking about Snow, I found her a really interesting character. I mean, she didn't have the easiest of childhoods. Um, but even as an adult, uh, you'd probably say that she's quite vulnerable and maybe taken advantage of in, in some instances. And while she does do things which some people would think are terrible and, and cruel, there's a real, I had a real empathy for her and felt sad for her. Um, she struck me as a really interesting character and did you enjoy writing Now Snow? you see, I, I, I didn't feel sorry for her and, and the, the reason I wrote, so Snow is the main character in the book in a way mm -hmm. and she's writing letters from prison and she's desperately trying to convince anyone of her innocence and really the reader will decide whether or not she's innocent of those crimes of which she's accused. Mm. And that happens to journalists all the time. Mm -hmm. We get letters um, from families of prisoners and also sometimes from prisoners, which in many states is against the law. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a cliche too that people say, well, everybody in prison is innocent, but some of them must be. I mean, mm. there must be miscarriages of sure. justice. And so I guess I was interested, and I have been interested in, in corresponding with people who have been found guilty of crimes how they react to their sentencing mm. and to the to the declaration of their guilt. Mm. So for example, earlier this year, I spent a lot of time talking to a woman who had been sentenced to prison for the murder of her infant. Um, she insisted that she was innocent. And in the end, as a journalist, I wasn't able to write her story. There were right. a number of, number of legal barriers that we came up against. Mm -hmm. But to this day, she insists upon her innocence. Mm. And I thought to myself, the public, knowing all the facts, might go either way. Mm. And in fact, the jury went one way, could mm. have gone the other way. Mm. And so when I was thinking about Snow, I was thinking, y you say that you felt some sympathy for her because some things happened to her when she was a child. But you know what? Very few amongst us have an easy childhood. You mm. know, we all have something that we wish we'd rather not had happened. You know, mm. maybe the relationship with our parents wasn't great or a sibling died or there wasn't enough money. Or, but you can be a victim or you can decide to get up and get on with it. Sure. And I much more admire people who get up and get on with it because mm. what happened to her happens to a lot of people. Sure. And they don't turn around and do what she did. Sure, that's true. It's an interesting way... Um, I think for readers to make their own determination they, and, and, and you do will. allow them that in and the book. And some will judge me harshly right. for, and I think that they will, uh, there will be many who say that they have sympathy for her yeah. and, and I'll be interested to have that debate with them. <laughs> well, Caroline, it's lovely to talk with you. It's always um, good to talk to you We like too. to finish off by asking um, all the people on Random Book Talk uh, their favourite book and why. Right now? Yes, oh. <laughs> right now. To right. put you on the spot. <laughs> Well, I've just read Gone Girl, which I loved. Right. I've, and the reason I loved it was because it has all the things that I wish and hope to put into books of my own, which is this idea of not knowing what is going to happen. So you have to keep turning the pages so that you can find out which way is it going to go. And I found Gone Girl was one of those books where I just wanted to keep going and I was constantly surprised. And if I can pull that off, then I'll be happy. Thank you, Caroline. You can go to our website now where you can find reading group notes and a sample chapter of Sisters of Mercy. And while you're there, why not sign up to our e-newsletter? See you next month.